And welcome back. We're with David Sarita. David, there's no question that the activity from the sun, I think, has an incredible amount of influence here on the planet. Do you think the Mayans understood this, hence the December 21st, 2012 date? Well, yeah, you know, we're, we're not even anywhere near solar maximum right now. You're talking the end of 2012-2013, NASA is predicting solar maximum. And so you're, when you're seeing X 1.9 flares at this stage in the game, I mean, Russia is so scared in their press, they're, they're talking about shutting down all their nuclear power plants because they know what will happen if we, if we get a direct hit. The current massive magnetic and sunspot is facing us right now. It's in perfect alignment to Earth. This is the same one that produced the... the, the the X-class flare that glanced us, and actually 10 million people are reported without power in Chile and, and South America. Well, we've been so lucky, David. If that was a direct hit, satellites, a grid system, every way that we think of life today would go down for months. This wouldn't be just days, would it? No, and you're talking about the next two to three days. That is a possibility with the power and the magnitude of this spot. It's in, as we speak, it is perfectly directly aligned to us on the very day that Comet Elenin is crossing the ecliptic. Once again, the sun has been triggered by Elenin or not. I don't know. All I know is the coincidence is there that every time Elenin crosses the ecliptic, and this time it's between the Earth and the sun, the previous times it was outside of the, of the orbit of the sun and the Earth. So I, I just can't, I can't accept that that's a coincidence, that there's something about Elenin and its magnetic field effects. It might. It, it, it might it be might. causing this. Now, now, this communication then with the ETs, I, I find this to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Is it tied into these events in that I don't think they're influencing them, but are they going to tip us off to anything, or do they not get involved? Well, they, they get very involved, and, you know, I have so much information, we would have to do another show for me to tell you everything they told me. But what I can tell you is that first, remember, I asked them, and this is recorded with my voice on a CD and then broadcast out through the quantum energy generator, to appear in a way that wouldn't compromise their security. But then I asked them to beam themselves in my house in, during the transmission. Well, on September 15th, and Ellen is getting really close. You, you there, remember the report of the big fireball that was seen from Arizona to Vegas to, to Southern California? Do you remember that? I do. Okay, that was huge news. But what people missed in that story was on September 15th, an ABC News reporter in Phoenix saw a hovering giant glowing orb of light, which he took a picture of on a, on a one-second exposure, so the thing looks like it's zipping around. He said this thing was hovering. It went up into the upper atmosphere, and it was 20 minutes later that the fireball came burning down in green colors. Now, I asked myself, you know, I know I'm very aware of the classified super advanced Tesla death ray that we use to shoot down the Roswell flying saucer, let alone where that weapon is today, and I know all about it. It's very classified well, stuff. Well, if it's out there, it's been perfected even more. Oh, very, very perfected. It is our most classified weapon. I was offered a live demonstration of, of this weapon. Now, what burns green, George? I mean, meteorites are mostly iron and nickel. That's, That's right. what yeah. they really are, and that burns orange. What You've got to ask yourself, is this, is this ABC News report stating that he saw a hovering ball of light that he took a picture of first, two incidences over Phoenix, and then it comes, 20, 30 minutes later, it comes burning down and going, you know, crossing between uh, Arizona and Southern California, and people saw it in Vegas. They even saw it in Colorado. Well, I'll ask myself, what burns Green. Well, copper burns green. Copper burns green. That's There's right. There's no copper. Magnesium and manganese burn blue, right? Right. Cobalt burn, burns blue. And then you have um, you have krypton, which is not kryptonite like in Superman. Krypton gas, which is extremely trace volume in our atmosphere, burns green. But it's, you're not going to see a green glow from a meteor burning through the krypton, extremely trace layers of krypton. So scrap that idea. Beryllium burns green. And that is a highly, highly toxic substance. Um, and it's extremely trace amounts are in some meteorites. So we're playing we're playing devil's advocate here. Is was the UFO over Phoenix? Was it part of Elenin? And was it part of what I asked them to appear in you know Arizona skies? Is you know that's really stretching it a little. Did you get an answer for that? Well, here's what happens. The next day, which is the 16th of September. I'm sleeping in my bed in the middle of the day, having a nap with my little one-year-old, you know, not quite one-year-old daughter. Oh, congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you. There's nothing like having a, having a child. It's, it's, Been there. Been there, done that. <laughs> it's just too much fun. But anyway, Alara's sleeping. I'm in a half-in, half-out state, and my wife is outside, you know, doing laundry. And this is a big place. And I hear a person sitting in the chair where she normally sits typing on the computer. And I said, that's not a computer this, that Crystal's typing on. My wife's name is Crystal. What is that? And I look over. I'm awake. And you don't believe this. There is a, there is a very tall, from seven to eight foot tall, space age looking woman sitting there with some type of device. And she's pointing it at my daughter, who's asleep in the bed. And I, I was just in shock. I, mean, I, can't even, I can't even describe what it's like to 
With your physical eyes open now. David, you've either got the most vivid imagination or something very strange is happening over well, there. Well, watch what happens, George. This gets really trippy because it turns into a national incident. This device person has the space thing has in their hands. Now, I haven't seen a ghost with my eyes open for over a year. My daughter, Alara, I clearly saw her uh, three months before her birth, which was October of last year, so she's about to become one. I thought I lost the ability to see ghosts. I thought it's over. Now, I'm not going to be doing that anymore. And this is daytime. I, I see ghosts at night. This is not a ghost. These are physical sounds. There's a physical person sitting in a chair who looks very space-age with this type of a computer I've never seen. They're projecting a movie on a clear sheet of crystal. It's a clear, thin slab of crystal hovering, uh, levitating above my daughter's head, and it's playing a movie, which is a very strange movie. A little, a little boy has a glass of water in his hand at the beach, and all of a sudden a wave comes and knocks the, the water from his hands. And I thought, what is that? Well, this was my wife. I said, Crystal, where, you weren't sitting in that chair. Where were you? She goes, I heard the person sitting in that chair. I didn't know who it was. So I have my wife actually heard this happen. Later the same day in Tucson at Huffman Air Force Base, there was a report of a person with what was thought to be a weapon in their hands, and they shut down the military base. Who was the person? They describe it as a woman? They just, they don't, they don't really know. They, they called it an armed intruder, turned up at Davis Monsman Air Force Base. I'm looking at the report right now. They never found them. The base was closed all day long. Now, this is all in the vicinity of the same area where an ABC News reporter saw a, probably a UFO, took a picture of it. 30 minutes later, the fireball comes burning down. The next day, there is a... I swear to God, George, I, I never, I've only seen two daylight sightings of a ghost with my physical eyes open in my whole life, and this is the second one. And this was clear, physical person that was reported at the base. They never found them. They reopened the base, and they don't really know who the intruder Did you, was. Do you think you opened up a portal with this machine? Well, this is, I think so, George. And I, I, you know, I, I'm, I know your show is very open. You, if you can accept it, remote viewing, if you can accept cha psychic channeling, this is one step different than that, and I'm using technology to send my questions out. But the answer... And you send it out in English, and it comes back to you mentally in English, obviously. No, well, no, this was... The, the, remember, I, I got the signal on my, on my detector in magnetic mode only. I didn't get any microwaves. There was no microwave activity, which means it's, I wasn't getting a, a radio or, or microwave transmission. That's where we broadcast TV. That was dead. I wasn't getting anything in electric mode, only magnetic. And I use magnetic harmonic resonance. Well, is the machine a, a receiver or a transmitter? It's a transmitter. Only. I haven't, I haven't tuned it to be a receiver. You're the receiver. Exactly. All right, and, let's, and, let's take some calls here, David. They're lining up for you, then we'll come back and chat. Okay. Let's go to Bill in West Hartford, Connecticut, east of the Rockies. Bill, go ahead. You're on coast. Yes, hi, George. Hi. Uh, David, David, all that I'm saying is with all due respect, honestly, honestly, it's with all due respect. I am an amateur astronomer. I know space and astronomy, and I'm an atheist myself, and George Norrie knows that. I know in my head the amount of, uh, the equivalent of a master's degree in astronomy, although I don't have it officially. George Norrie called you Dr. David so-and-so. You cannot be... No, no, I, no. I've never called him Dr. Really? All right, all right, my, all right, my point is you don't know space and astronomy. Bear with me. Just bear with me. The basis of what you said relates to Billy Meyer. You talked about Pleiades, Pleiades star system, or uh, just as Billy Meyer did many decades ago. Now, you should know, if you know anything about space and astronomy, as I know, that Pleiades is not a star system, it's not a solar system, it's not even the seven sisters that people see with the naked eye. The Pleiades is a massive star cluster of over 100,000 stars if you look at it through a huge Earth-based telescope or even the Hubble Space Telescope. So my question to you specifically is, what star of those 100,000 or more stars did you send the so-called signal to? Merope. Pardon? I didn't hear you. Merope. How, do, how did you... You, know, you, you want to know how I did it. I've given some clues here and some proof in quantum physics that that's faster than light signals have been detected by some of the best physicists in the world. In fact, I even gave an, a piece of evidence of, of Dr. Raymond Chow, and that was publicized, that he got photons, which carry information, to go faster than the speed of light using crystal. And I'm also showing you how William Shockley, who invented the transistor with Johan Bardeen and, and Will Bratton, it gave birth to, a, to you know, fa super, super clear and fast radio telecommunications because of a crystal. So... I'm showing you also a little bit of a clue about biological systems, but when it comes to the math, of course I know what the Pleiades are. Of course I know there's, there's literally hundreds of... Well, and you answered his question with the star that you popped this at. And I, I know... By the way, how... I, I've never called you David, ever, uh, in my I life. Know. No, listen, I worked Dr. for David. Nobel Prize winning physicists for over 10 years. I've studied quantum physics for longer than most people spend in all their years in school. My, well, but you can understand, David, how people would think this is a tall tale here. Well, of course, right? and when, when Tesla... The father of radio, who in the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 uh, sent the first human 
radio broadcast successfully before Marconi did, and this is this is the U.S. Supreme Court ruled June 21, 1943, the Tesla Lodge and Stone are the true fathers of radio. And then radio evolved to transistorize radio, which became much, much more clear. Tesla said he received intelligent radio signals with information in the signal from Venus. Now, when Tesla said that, no one believed him, yet he wrote letters about it, but he's the guy who invented radio. Tesla doesn't have a Ph.D. Tesla is mostly a self-taught electrical engineer. I was the director of the Tesla Foundation. I spoke in Congress on the Tesla Foundation on nuclear fusion. I was around Nobel Prize winners for over a decade of my life. And I'm telling you, I know how to build radios, and I know why they don't work, and I know why they don't have the ability to send a signal faster than the speed of light. What I did was experimental, but yet every single time we've done it, and with different people, every person, and I'm willing to do this with, with you, George Norrie. If you want to record a series of questions, I will run it through my broadcaster, and you tell me if you have an experience. I'll do that. Absolutely. This is, this is an and how do, I, how do I get there? Can we MP3 it to you? All you've got to do is send me an MP3 All right. questions, and you can, you can do any star system you want. I'll record three questions tomorrow, and we'll, uh, we'll MP3 and I'll them And I'll send it out, and I'll tell you the date and the time that I sent it out. Now, and should I hear an answer instantly? Or, or when you well, say, George, I've sent it out, when should I get an answer? The first time we did it, the first time we did it, which was August 21st, 2010, I sent out my wife's jazz song, and I was really kind of bedazzled and shocked when I heard the loud voice. Two nights later, because we sent out a series of questions, which I haven't talked about tonight, the first day after the transmission, nothing happened. The second day, the signal was so strong on our property, it was like a spaceship was right over our house. My psyche was torn wide open. They told me things about presidents. They told me things about, about Gerald Ford and that... I didn't even know Gerald Ford was interested in UFOs. They told me things about the, 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 the battle in the United States government right now. They told me what they looked like. They showed me how they have to cloak their craft because of the weapons we use to shoot them down. They told me so many things in, in August 20, 22nd of, of 2010. I mean, it would take a whole show to... All right, let's take some more calls. And Bill, thank you out there in West Hartford. And by the way, Bill, never have to apologize if you don't agree with a guest. I mean, that's what, that, this show is based on your well, thoughts, he's saying, Q&A. Well, you I know what the Pleiades are. I know the temperature. Well, of you the told them. You told them. I know, and I know why people don't believe you can live in the Pleiades, because they're young stars and they're very hot. But if you understand what what a, chris- a liquid crystal is, which is what we are, we're very weak electrical liquid crystals. Well, crystal. that's why I'm, I'm, I'm my next guest next hour, when we talk about spontaneous human right, combustion, I think in. there's a tie-in. That's a tie-in, because, you see, if you increase your, your liquid crystal of your very biological self, which a lot of yogis do by drinking super, super mineral water, your body can handle super high levels of electricity and not burn up. You see, William Tiller is proof of that. They've got Qigong masters measuring tens and, and scores of volts on copper walls. Where well, good Qigong masters, as you know, David, can literally stop a human attacker from approaching them just with the energy force. So Exactly. So if you can increase your bioelectricity because of your own liquid crystal state, you can handle higher temperatures and live in higher temperature planetary environments and therefore hotter temperature suns. We're very, very weak liquid crystals. Let's go. All right, David, tell us, how do you beam this machine? What do you do? You point it physically, and then what do you do? Turn it on? The you, battery? You, you see, we're used to, like the last caller, you know, they want super beams, and, and we want to point things at a, at a star system. You know, when you're pointing something at the Pleiades today, it's 444-year-old light. That, that's how long it took that light to come here from that system. And you look at, you know, Sirius is 8.3 or 7 light years from Earth, so that's 8, you know, plus-year-old light. So you're... You're, looking, you're not even looking at the true position of the star. But one of the things that, that triggered me was in the movie The Secret Life of Plants, not the book, in the movie there was a very well-known astronomer that pointed his telescope at Sirius, and at the end of the light collection he put some sprouted mustard seeds and connected some electrodes to the mustard seeds. And he connected the, the, uh, the electrodes to an amplifier, and he, this was in the movie, The Secret Life of Plants, which was not well distributed. Hardly anybody saw the movie. I saw it. And he believed he was getting what appeared to be an intelligent signal from that star system. And, you know, that is, is very, we know that biological systems have the mechanism to send faster-than-light information. You know, Fritz That's Albert sure. Pop, who measured the existence of biophotons, all living things that are emitting auric light, and these communications between plants pop found were faster than light speed. So it really made sense. And I was really stunned that that astronomer, because I looked his name up, I, I don't remember his name now, he, he led a very successful career in astronomy, and I don't know why he never pursued it further. And I think one of the reasons is this. A lot of today's astronomers don't really believe much in ancient civilizations and mythologies of star beings from Sirius and from the Pleiades. In fact, if you read the Rig Veda, which I've read, probably the oldest piece of literature on the planet, a spiritual literature, is the Rig Veda. Some, some astronomers and, and scientists argue in India that it's over 
10, 15,000 years old, which makes it older than the Old Testament in, in, the, in the Jewish, you know, um, holy books. And in the Rig Veda, there is clearly a being or a god from that star system, from the Pleiades, Kritika, who allegedly took human DNA and human human beings and archived them in that star system. Um, so when we, you know, mythologists believe that, that these beings did come from these star systems, but modern astronomers don't. And when Robert Temple wrote the book The Serious Mystery, which, which I was a great, you know, follower of, a British royal astronomer gets criticized by the establishment because he actually believes that Sirius is occupied by demigods and beings that are not just myth, myth in the sense of storytelling. They're, they really exist. Now, once you believe and you, you do a little bit of historical research on the personalities in those star systems, you're more likely to try to send that star system a message. You know, why have, have researchers like Hogan been so frustrated that NASA won't land a, a module on Mars right in Cydonia to see what it is close up because these people are not – they're not educated in mythologies, and they, they don't really believe there's any truth there, so they're not motivated for one. And to send a message faster than the speed of light, I believe that, that our government has already done it. I really, I really believe that there is so much evidence when you 